Recently, somebody asked me, Brendan, why are your dosage recommendations for MOTC so high? And they were referring to the quick reference guide I have in my Peptide Mastery course, and they even went on to suggest, how can I trust anything else you say when you're recommending like up to 17 times as much as guys like Dr. Seeds, who's recommending only five milligrams of MOTC? And they even referenced that MOTC is often only available in five milligram vials on the market. And I agree, yeah, it is, but it's not that my recommendations are too high. It's that all the other experts' recommendations are too low, and they've re been repeating this information for far too long. So in this video, I'm going to show you how I come up with my dosage recommendations, because I'm not just guessing here, okay? I'm actually using relatively sound formulas and mathematics used to calculate these dosages from rodent studies and bring that over to humans. And I also look at a MOTC analog, which has been tested in humans at a much higher dosage than what MOTC is being recommended by these experts. So in this video, I'm going to break it all down for you and explain what MOTC is, first of all, which is mitochondrial derived peptide. And I'm going to explain how I come to my dosage recommendations being over 17 times higher than other experts. And this is important because if you want to get the best possible results from peptides such as MOTC, you need to be dosing them accurately. So I just wrote this article on why your MOTC dose might be 17 times too low. And I provide citations throughout this article, so feel free to check them out if you want. But I just want to run through this article with you. So MOTC is a mitochondrial-derived peptide encoded by mitochondrial DNA. It's transcribed in response to exercise or metabolic stress, and it improves metabolic processes by increasing the expression of genes involved in metabolic health, such as the acar -AMP k pathway, which improves the coenzyme NAD+, and enhances insulin sensitivity, vascular health, and cellular functioning. And it may also slow down aging. In fact, mitochondrial health is important in preventing the repression of genes that occurs with aging due to increased heterochromatin. Now, I talk about this a lot in my Peptide Mastery course, but if this doesn't make sense to you, I encourage you to check out my video on how peptides are changing the world, where I give a comprehensive yet simplified breakdown of this process. But mitochondrial enhancers like MOTC, they can induce this deheterochromatization, which essentially unlocks genes which have become either repressed, silenced, or at least had their expression reduced due to the effects of biological aging. But that's not the way that all peptides induce deheterochromatization. For example, in the video I've referenced here, I mentioned Covenson's peptides, and they can bind directly to histone proteins and interact with them in a way which induces deheterochromatization as well. And that's not directly related to proving mitochondrial function directly. So there are other mechanisms, and I just wanted to make that clear. So you see, while MOTC's functions have been studied in humans and have been shown to be released in response to exercise and decline with aging, there have been no trials conducted to assess ideal human dose administration for MOTC. Now in this uh, image right here, you could see a guy on a stationary bike and how MOTC levels increased. There has, however, been human trials on a MOTC analog called CB4211, and it showed really great effects in improving non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and diabetes which is real common in obese patients, and these patients were obese. And it was administered at 25 milligrams daily via injection for four weeks. So you could see the blue line here. And it decreased liver enzymes quite significantly, fasting glucose quite significantly, and body weight, and it improved all these biomarkers in the chart here. So it's actually quite impressive. So back to MOTC. We can either continue to do what the herd mentality says and continue to dose MOTC at five milligrams, or we could take a highly educated guess based on the science we have available. And as a former medical engineer at Philips who designed life-saving ventilators, especially the Trilogy Model 100 ventilators, I understand that guessing is just too risky in this field of work. And so is taking other people's word for things. So I prefer devising the most effective solutions possible, and that's how I get people real results. So I looked at several rodent studies on MOTC. In mice, MOTC was tested at 5 milligrams per kilogram and also 15 milligrams per kilogram with a good effect on exercise performance. However, the 15 milligram per kilogram group had a better effect. And in a vascular calcification study in rats, MOTC was tested at 5 milligrams per kilogram with good results. And in a diabetic model with rats, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram daily for eight weeks combined with exercise worked quite well. But I wanted to calculate what this would convert to in humans. However, there are some challenges in using normal human equivalent dose formulas. Formulas are only as good as the data used to build them, and the best head equation we currently have uses an animal's CAM value, which factors in body surface area between species, and this accounts for differences in drug metabolism. However, there are some obvious nuances to be aware of, such as the age of animals used in a study as metabolism can slow down in old age, and when it comes to peptides, there is something not so obvious to be aware of, because they are broken down in a different way than drugs. 
While drugs are metabolized through the CYP pathways in the liver, like the cytochrome P450 pathway, peptides are metabolized by peptidases. These cleave peptide bonds to break them down into smaller peptide fragments and eventually amino acids. Again, I talk about this in my How Peptides Are Changing the World's video. So while the head formulas work good for small molecule drugs, I have not been able to find any specific examples of how it works for peptides. So with these nuances in mind, I still calculated out the head for MOTC peptide based on four cases and found a much higher dose than what's recommended by others. Here's the formula I used. Head equals animal dose divided by kilograms times animal KM divided by human KM. Now the animal KM can be found in a chart and it's different for each species, but human KM is 37. And when plugging in the numbers from the mice and the rat studies with MOTC, I referenced I had got 1.215 milligrams per kilogram for humans with the 15 milligrams per kilogram mouse dose, which was the best effect exercise study. 0.405 milligrams per kilogram for the 5 milligram per kilogram mouse dose, which was the exercise study that still had a good effect. 0.81 milligrams per kilogram for the 5 milligram per kilogram rats dose, which was the arterial calcification study and 0.081 milligrams per kilogram for the diabetic rat model when combined with exercise. As such, my recommendations for a 70 kilogram person would be 5.67 milligrams to 85.05 milligrams. Now these dosages were so far beyond what other experts, including doctors, were recommending that it made other people think I was the one who was wrong. So I wanted to take things further just to see if the head conversions I did were on point. So I developed my own method to estimate a dosage. I calculated a discrepancy factor, otherwise known as the dosage difference, specifically for peptides in which there exists both rodent and human studies. The idea was to use data from both human and rodent studies for a peptide at the high end of the dosage range, then apply this discrepancy factor to other peptides with limited human dosing data, or no human dosing data. So all I had to do was divide the human dose per kilogram by the rodent dose per kilogram for a peptide that had both human and rodent studies. Then I could simply take this discrepancy factor and apply it to MOTC to see if it aligned with head conversion. Ideally, I'd have devised a discrepancy factor for another mitochondrial peptide that is similar to MOTC, but there was not enough data to do this, so I used Cmax as a reference. I compared the high end of the dosage range in human studies to the high end in rodent studies, which gave a discrepancy factor of 7.1. Applying this factor to MOTC, I estimated a human dose of 0.471 milligrams per kilogram. This would be 32.97 milligrams for a 70 kilogram human, it just so happens that this dose falls within the head calculations and is just slightly more than the MOTC analog CB4211 was administered at in humans. This method also has some limitations, however. For example, as mentioned earlier, a formula is only good as its inputs. It's possible that mice and human studies on CMAX stopped at dosages that could have still gone higher with good results. It's not like these dosages are would have been established to be the most optimal for rodents and humans, which would have made for an even more ideal discrepancy factor. However, it's the best we can do right now, and it adds even more additional support for the use of high-dose MOTC determined by head. Conclusion. As an engineer, I always took calculations seriously, rather than other people's words for things. So while 5 milligrams clearly does work for some people, and a slightly higher head, which is 5.67 milligrams, helps diabetic rats in combination with exercise more than exercise alone, it seems to be just enough as opposed to what's ideal for someone with chronic health problems, such as arterial calcification, or someone who wants to improve their exercise performance the most. The conservative dose recommendations by others could be a result of the high price of MOTC, and then wanting to recommend what is affordable rather than what is optimal. However, that's not how we should do things. We should always present what is optimal first and foremost, so that the people who can afford to benefit from it the most can do so. Hi, I'm Brennan Henry, former medical engineer for Philips and creator of the world's first peptide masterclass covering all 40 Covington's peptides, along with 26 additional peptides and their optimal uses. I developed this course and the accompanying free course due to the lack of cutting edge accurate information available. This course is the culmination of thousands of hours of research, personal experimentation, and testing with my group of over 1,500 researchers. My goal was to create the most comprehensive, in-depth, and scientifically accurate coverage of peptides ever made. Spreading awareness about peptides and the incredible effects they have is a core part of our mission at Scientific Augmentation and is incredibly important to me. These peptides have transformed the health of my clients and their loved ones in ways their doctors have called miraculous, but it's important that you know how to best use them. Unfortunately, much of the available peptide information is inaccurate. For instance, there are experts out there claiming Pinilon is the pineal gland peptide, releasing entire videos and posts dedicated to it, when this is fundamentally incorrect. 
There are doctors who are recommending dosages of MOTC, which might be 